This is K.M. Wyland, and you are listening to the 417th episode of the Helping Writers Become Authors podcast. I finished remodeling my office this last December, and I just love it. It was originally supposed to be a whole black and gold and red art deco theme. That didn't quite happen, but it feels very sleek and fun. I moved to a different room with a window right above the desk. Too high to be distracting, but high enough to let me see the Canadian geese as they fly over. This new setup is a lot less cluttered and better optimized to help me focus while writing. Someday I'd still like to play with the notion of creating separate workspaces for writing and business, but for now this is really nice. I'm definitely a creature of habit, but sometimes just tweaking things around is a great change of pace. Whether it's a new setup or not, my focus on writing has been excellent since the start of the year. I'm rolling along on Dreambreaker's first draft, nearing the midpoint, and also on editing Wayfair for its publication later this year. I'm also nearing the halfway point on its last big edit before I start in on proofreading. January seemed like both a long month and a short one in its own way, but it was definitely productive in my new office. And now I hope you enjoyed this week's podcast, four tips for writing to the right audience. Here's my somewhat radical idea. Writers don't need to know who their audience is. And yes, I know this goes entirely against popular advice, which encourages, even insists, that beginning authors must know their audience. I probably even said basically that somewhere or other on my site. You're supposed to go as far as to write up a dossier of your ideal reader, sometimes even complete with a stock photo. Or, at the very least, you're supposed to think of one person who you know reads your books, your mom, your editor, that one really nice reviewer, and write solely to that person as a representative of your audience. On the surface, those ideas don't sound so bad. And yet, when writers sit down to try to form an idea of their ideal audience, most of us come up blank. We're like, my audience is, you know, anybody who likes books like this. Helpful, isn't it? Here's the thing, though. Your audience only matters when it comes time to market the book. The whole write a dossier of your ideal reader thing, that's a copywriting trick, an advertising technique. Sure, you're probably writing this book for eventual sale, but frankly, selling it is the last thing you should be thinking about when you're writing it. Time enough to figure out who to sell it to once you've finished and know what kind of book you've got. So does that mean you should completely forget about an audience while writing? Should you just pretend no one but you is ever going to see this book? The answer to that is yes and no. Writing for the right audience is incredibly important, but it's not what you think, partly because finding that audience is actually incredibly easy. These days... Publishing is the Wild West. Authors are entirely responsible for carrying their own marketing six guns. We have to be both artist and business person. And it's a tough balance, especially if you're determined to make a living. I am all for business savvy authors going out there with their amazing books and crushing it. But I am first and always an advocate for the art. You will never hear me tell an author to write to the market. But when an author writes to an audience, that's often exactly what's happening. Writing to an audience is the first step on the dark road to the kind of soulless disasters Hollywood is churning out right now. It may be a road paved with good intentions, and it is certainly not a road that always leads to soulless disasters, but it is a road that oversteps the most important question of creativity. That question is not, will this sell and who will buy it? but rather, what do I want to say, and why is this important to me? Art is a microcosm of the world. What is important to one artist is, in at least some small measure, always important to the world. Thus, if what is valuable to the artist herself is being overridden by commercial concerns, what is valuable to the world will also be overridden. And yet, you gotta have an audience, right? And you gotta find it somewhere, right? Actually, no. I would argue that you don't find the right audience. The right audience finds you. I don't mean that in a marketing sense, because that 
really another topic altogether. What we're talking about here is writing to the right audience. In his beautifully iconoclastic and thought-provoking book, Several Short Sentences About Writing, Verlin Klinkenborg offers a great analogy. He says, imagine a cellist playing one of Bach's solo suites. Does he consider his audience? Did Bach, for that matter? Does he play the suite differently to audiences of different incomes and educations and social backgrounds? No. The work selects the audience. You don't need to create a complex dossier of your ideal reader. You don't need to hunt down the perfect stock photo of what this person might look like. Just go stand in front of the mirror. You are your perfect audience. As Toni Morrison famously said, if there's a book that you want to read, but it hasn't been written yet, then you must write it. As we've talked about elsewhere recently, the most important ingredient you bring to your art is yourself. Never lose that in trying to appeal to what you think readers want. This doesn't mean you aren't always trying to improve your technique or make your writing as accessible as possible, but it does mean that if you're not writing something you would kill to read, then you're probably writing the wrong thing. This is true on so many levels. Not only should you be writing to the reader who enjoys the stories, characters, and themes that you do, you should also be writing to a reader who has reached your own level of reading. Don't write down to readers. Expect them to be as smart as you, as story savvy as you, as keen about all your favorite weird subjects as you. Sure, there will be readers who aren't quite there, but in trusting even them, you are giving them the gift of an opportunity to rise rather than an excuse to remain complacent. More than that, you're being honest. Arguably, Honesty is one of the single most important components in truly resonant art of any kind. If you can do this, if you can write to yourself as the audience, you'll discover you're not just writing to yourself. You're one in a million, remember? That means there are upwards of 10,000 people just like you and a whole lot more whose interests overlap. That's your audience. Basically, my big bit of advice here is write for yourself and don't worry too much about your readers. Not yet, anyway. As they say, the first draft is for the writer, the second draft is for the reader. Once you realize this, there are a couple steps you can take to optimize this mindset in creating your best possible book. And here are four. Step number one, write to your audience of one. This is where it all starts. Just write a book you would objectively love to read. And that's not as simple as it sounds. It can be incredibly easy to write a book, enjoy writing it, and then realize, usually a few years later, that this book is not even close to something you'd like to read, but actually even presents characters and themes with which you're in total disharmony. I know, I've done it. And this can happen for two reasons. Reason number one. You're trying to imitate authors you perceive as successful or especially erudite. Reason number two, you're unconsciously, or not so unconsciously, mimicking trends you're absorbing in popular media. This is why it's important to be rigorously aware of yourself as a person and in turn rigorously honest with yourself as a writer. When I'm in the prep stages of my novel's outlines, I always try to step back and objectively evaluate the ideas I'm coming up with. Is this theme playing out like this because this is how it always plays out? Or because it's representing something I believe is true? Is this character behaving like this because this is how this type of character is expected to behave? Or because it feels honest and true to me? Am I creating this plot because it's a familiar and successful iteration or because I am just insanely in love with it. This goes for the writing itself. Choose words and write sentences that make sense to you and that you feel you would enjoy reading. Don't limit yourself to your preconceptions of your reader's skill level. Time enough to make adjustments for any errors in judgment, aka writing that wasn't quite as brilliant as you thought it was, when you start getting feedback from confused beta readers. Step number two, trust your readers as humans. Writers often end up on two extreme ends of the spectrum. 
Either we just assume readers will get what we're saying, no matter how incomprehensible, or we worry readers won't get anything we're trying to say and we just spell it all out. You know both are mistakes because you know that, as a reader, you would appreciate neither. Your goal is to try to strike the perfect balance of clarity and trust that you find in your own favorite authors. One of the best rules of thumb is simply remembering your readers are humans too. They're living this life, same as you, learning as they go, same as you. The older and more mature they are, the more likely they are to extrapolate your subtext, and thus the less likely they will need every little nuance spelled out. Klinkenborg reminds us, it helps to remember that your prose is going to be read against two different backdrops. What the reader knows about reading and what the reader knows about life. It's surprising how many writers forget the life part. Step number three, trust your readers as readers. Last week, we talked about reading as a learned skill and how readers are at different levels depending on their depth of experience. The primary reason it's so important for writers to be experienced readers is because they cannot write books that surpass their own reading skills. It is not possible for a writer to write a book better than those he is able to understand and appreciate as a reader. Although it is certainly possible to read and enjoy books of a higher level than our current writing skill set. Because you are trying to write the kind of book you would enjoy reading, it is important not to write a book that is less complex and trusting of the reader than the books you read. Write bravely. Write with all the intelligence and audacity you can muster. Dare much and throw it all out there on the page. Your beta readers, critique partners, and editors exist to tell you when you've missed the mark, when your complexity is really just obtuse, or your trust of readers to get it is really just a plot hole. But save all of that for the second draft. When you're initially writing this story, write it for yourself, knowing you will totally get it. Readers appreciate books that trust them. It allows them to enter the imaginative experience as a co-writer and the thematic experience as a peer of equal frankness and insight with the author. Trusting your readers starts with trusting yourself as a writer. Step number four, write rigorously imagined literature. One of the reasons reading fiction is a learned skill is that there are often certain genre conventions that are not immediately intuitive to new readers. Often, as in science fiction, fantasy, and historical novels, among others, the writer must simply trust the reader to get aspects of the form without taking the time to spell it out. In Light the Dark, William Gibson explained, from the vantage of high-concept science fiction, sophisticated science fiction requires a sort of cultural superstructure of reading skill. We forget, as readers of long-form fiction, that at one time we didn't know how to do that. We had to acquire the skill through cultural education. It's the same with good sci-fi, which generally requires a sort of superstructure of cultural experience to make it pleasurably accessible. As a reader, I want to encounter rigorously imagined literature. Now, yes, this inevitably means you're going to lose some readers. But if you lose them over something like this, then they weren't your readers anyway, were they? Rigorously imagined literature encompasses a thorough, detailed understanding of your story's inner workings. It's theme, plot, character arcs, setting, both physical and historical, language, and details. Writing something deeply complex and asking readers to figure it out is totally different from writing something blurry and vague and asking readers to fill in the blanks. Now, this takes work. This takes discipline. It requires logic as well as creativity. Historian David McCullough nailed it when he said, writing is thinking clearly. To write well is to think clearly. That is why it is so hard. But if that is what you expect from your own favorite authors, Seems only fair to expect it from yourself as well, right? Writing to the right audience is about nothing more or less than the same old directive to write the best book 
you possibly can by first having a clear understanding of what you're writing and why. The answers to both those questions come from deep within yourself. If you can gain a clear understanding of what you enjoy as a reader and why you enjoy it, as well as what turns you off and why, you will have taken huge steps toward writing the kind of book that will appeal to your ideal audience of rabid fans. So let me leave you with one last challenge from Klinkenborg. Say more than you thought you knew how to say in sentences better than you ever imagined for the reader who reads between the lines. Thank you for listening to the Wordplay Podcast. To read a transcript of this episode, you can visit my website at helpingwritersbecomeauthors.com. And be sure to check back again next week.